Are Duet 3D main bods worth the money? And how hard is it to switch over from Marlin to RepRap firmware? Marlin by far is the most popular firmware for consumer 3D printers. I've made so many videos on my channel with modifications, the configuration of which was made possible by the flexibility of the Marlin firmware. So if Marlin is the most popular, then Duet 3D has a reputation for two things, being very expensive and being the best. I finally got around to fitting a Duet 3D Maestro to my second SK Go. In this video, we're gonna use my experiences from this to answer two questions. How does the Duet firmware compare to other popular offerings? And how hard is it if you're completely used to Marlin to switch over to the RepRap firmware that runs on Duet 3D hardware? Let's begin. Let's start by looking at the printer I'm going to be fitting this hardware to. I built the Seket SK Go as a kit and it's a large format Core XY FDM 3D printer with the philosophy of being over engineered and tinkering friendly. It's one of my favorite 3D printers in part because of the outstanding print quality and previously I fitted it with a remote flex drive extruder but recently it's been collecting dust as I had a broken part cooling duct so I wanted to redesign this as well as remix the flex drive extruder to use some spare Bontech gears. For this video, I've reassembled and patched up the part cooling fan duct with a 3D printing pen. As you can see from my before test prints, it's still not quite right, with a lot of overheating and distortion on the test cube and a little bit towards the top of the rook as well. Apart from that, this rook is a really nice print. What makes this printer suitable is that it came with an SKR version 1.3, but it already has mounting holes for Duet 2 boards. I feel the printer's quality justifies a more expensive board, plus I'll easily be able to make a comparison with the old hardware and firmware setup. Now we'll move on to comparing the hardware. Duet 3D has just released their third generation of main boards, but in this video we're concentrating on generation 2 and that includes the Maestro, Wi-Fi, and Ethernet. And no, they're not cheap. The new reduced price of the Maestro is $112, US whereas a Wi-Fi and Ethernet are $150 and $161, respectively. Duet 3D also has a large range of hardware accessories. This includes the PanelDew integrated touchscreen, with the 5-inch going for $81, US and the 7-inch for $99. I ended up ordering a Maestro and 5 inch touchscreen and it cost me a little over 400 Australian dollars. Although a viewer named Tal wanted me to test the board so much, he became a patron and donated 150 US dollars. I'll link this comparison page in the description as it's the best way to compare the various models of Duet 2 hardware. It should be noted that some unique things about the Duet is they support plug-in modules and that means you can use thermocouples as well as thermistors for high temperature printing. I've made this comparison table that compares the Duet hardware to other popular 3D printing mainboards. As a basis, we have our lowly Creality Melzi board. It's 8-bit, the slowest by far, and with limited program space, and that's why we always have to disable features to get Marlin firmware to fit on the microcontroller. As you can see, the SKR Mini is a good step up, being 32-bit, a lot faster, a lot more program space, and memory. The TH3D EasyBoard Lite is actually specced quite high. Its processor is the same as an SKR version 1.4 Turbo, and with that comes better speed, program space, and memory. Perhaps the best SKR board is the SKR Pro, and it really appears to be good bang for your buck. All of the specs are great, and this F stands for floating point, which is going to give it extra grunt for complex calculations. The second generation Duet main boards compare favorably to everything here, apart from perhaps the SKR Pro. The more expensive Wi-Fi and Ethernet boards also have a floating point processor to distinguish them from the cheaper Maestro. Just for fun, I've included the new Duet 3 mainboard. As you can see, the specs are insane. It's got a strong processor that's fast, has a lot of space and a lot of memory. Another thing worth comparing are the stepper motor drivers on each board. The Maestro comes with TMC 2224s and here I'm comparing it to the popular TMC 2209s. In this case it's hard to argue against the 2209s as they have better cooling, they have stall guard 4 and that allows sensorless homing and they can also handle more current to the stepper motors 
which means they'll run cooler with everything else being equal. The more expensive Duet 2s come with TMC 2660s and they compare more favorably to the 2209s. They use SPI instead of UART which is much of a muchness. They have stall guard for sensorless homing and they can handle a lot more phase current which means they can run bigger stepper motors or small ones with less heat buildup. The only thing they seem to be missing is stealth chop but they're still advertised as quiet. Perhaps someone with one of these boards can let me know just how quiet they are. The biggest part of this conversion is the hardware installation. The main board is nicely packaged and besides the board, you also get all of the connectors and pins and unless your printer was already using Molex connectors, you're going to have to rewire all of the plugs. Here's a size comparison with an SKR version 1.3. As you can see, the Duet is a little bit bigger and the SKR 1.3 lets you plug in whatever stepper drivers you want, whereas they're integrated on the Duet board. The screw terminals are also beefier, they're probably closer to what you find on the SKR Pro, which is much closer in size to the Duet Maestro. The panel due is again nicely packaged, and besides the actual touchscreen, it comes with two connectors, which we'll explain soon. I did need a housing for the touchscreen. I found this versatile one on Thingiverse, importing one of the parts into Tinkercad to add the tabs required to mount to the second SK Go. So now all I had to do was unbolt the old housing. My new printed one did lift up and wasn't perfect, but at least it was a straight fit, and that made it quick and easy. Now on to the mainboard wiring, and a lot of it was really quite long, so I was glad to have the chance to tidy things up. Your first step should be to label all of the wiring before unplugging anything. This will make the conversion much easier later on. Now you can unplug all of the wires and remove the old board. The SK Go has mounting for both boards, so all I had to do was move the screws and spacers to the proper holes. As you would hope, the holes were correct, so all I had to do was tighten back on the nuts. At this stage, I took the opportunity to invert the power supply and tidy up all of the mains wiring. At some stage, I'll design and print a plastic cover for this. The rest of the wiring is much more involved, but fortunately, there's some really good diagrams on the Duet website, and they contain the detail needed for things like the stepper motors and knowing which colors to wire in which order. Making the new connectors goes as follows. You need to cut off the old plug, strip back the wire, Insert the connector into your crimping tool, crush it flat, gripping the wire, and then insert the pins into the plastic connector and test they're secure. Now you can reference the diagram and plug them into the main board. It took me most of a day to get the majority of my wiring done. I got more efficient as I went, but overall it was still a slow process. Complicating things further was the fact that the copperhead hot end I'd backed on Kickstarter had arrived, so I wired up the heater and thermistor to avoid having to undo all of my cable wraps and do it all again later. Another complication I had is that I was running sensorless homing with my old setup. The Maestro stepper drivers don't support that, so I had to design these simple end stop brackets. They accept simple micro switches, and the whole system, although not as neat as sensorless homing, seems to work quite well. As for the panel due, you can use either connector, but if you wanna use the onboard SD card, you need to use the gray ribbon cable. The one that came with it was too short, so I used another, and it's important not to use one over 30 centimeters. I was pleased that after finishing my wiring, there were plenty of connectors and pins left over, should I have to redo anything or upgrade in the future. Now we can turn our attention to configuring the firmware. The first thing you need to know is that Duet hardware requires RepRap firmware, and there's quite a lot of guides on the wiki on how to set up various aspects. There's also a reference page outlining the differences from Marlin and Repetier. Here's a summary of the important differences. Marlin firmware is designed to support a very wide range of hardware. And as we saw in the earlier table, the available space for the program can vary quite a bit. Therefore, because of some smaller boards, we only compile the firmware features that we want for that particular printer. Once the firmware is on the printer, we can do additional tuning of parameters like e-steps by using G-code, and we can save those changes to the EEPROM. But if we have any major changes, we need to recompile the firmware. RepRap firmware is designed to support Duet hardware. Therefore, we have a known program flash size. Because of that, the firmware source is pre-compiled, which means we don't need to do it ourselves and all features are included. All of the parameters for the printer, every single thing, 
is listed as G-code and is loaded into the printer on boot. We can still make some changes and these are saved to an override file. And no matter how major the changes are, we can make them instantly just by sending lines of G-code. When I first powered up the printer, it was running firmware version 2.02, .02, but version 3 was now available. I found the updating firmware guide, but for me there was a few bits that conflicted here and made it more confusing. I did learn that I needed to upgrade to version 3 first, and then version 3.1. So I headed to the GitHub and scrolled down until I found version 3.0, and then downloaded the Maestro file and put it in the sys folder of the SD card. I rebooted the printer and entered M997S0 from the console and that updated the firmware to version 3.0. I put the binary for version 3.1 on the SD card, but repeating this process gave me an error. I had to go back to version 3.0 and add a file to the SD card that was required for version 3.1, and then after that I could update as before. In terms of configuring for my particular machine, I use the very good online configurator. This reminds me of the one supplied by TH3D to suit their main boards, where you go through on a web interface, filling out details before the finished file is provided at the end. Anything I didn't know offhand, I could refer back to the Marlin configuration files and then copy over the values. I wasn't too familiar with some of the settings, so I didn't get everything right the first time round, but it probably got me about three quarters of the way to it being correct. When you finish, it'll give you links to the latest firmware, the latest web control firmware, and then a download to a zip that contains all of the configuration files to be loaded onto the printer when it boots. The most important of these is config.g. This is what sets up the configuration of the firmware as soon as it's powered on, loading all of the settings one by one. For instance, near the top, an M669K1 tells the firmware that we're running a Core XY printer. Changes such as stepper motor direction are all set here, as well as which physical port relates to which axis. Things that you would need to recompile for in Marlin can be edited in this config G file, restart the printer and everything will be up to date. You can test changes in real time, so I connected via Pronterface and had the reference for the G code open in another window and if everything seemed okay, I could then go back and edit the config G file to make the changes permanent. The G code for RepRap firmware is much the same as Marlin, but with some additional functionality. Even the commands you're used to, such as G1 for moving, has additional arguments. For instance, if you add a H1, that axis will move, but only until it reaches an end stop. Because absolutely everything is set up with G-code, we have new G-codes such as M669 to set the kinematics type. By setting it to K0, we have a regular Cartesian printer. Mine was set to 1 for Core XY. 3 is a Delta printer, and all of these are the options, which means you can change your whole printer type on the fly. Let's have a look at how I set up some specific features. First up, tuning the bed and hot end with PID tuning. The process takes a little longer, but the G-code is very similar to Marlin, and at the end, you simply enter M500 to save it permanently. Next up is Pressure Advance, which is known as Linear Advance in Marlin. Like Marlin, we set this with G-code, but instead of a K-factor, we enter a time value. As you can see, direct drive is going to be something like 0.025 seconds, up to a very long Bowden tube having 0.7 seconds. There's not a really easy to use process for determining the right value, but there are three workarounds provided. I chose to follow the guide on the middle link, where you use the Marlin pattern generator, and then find and replace all to update the G code to suit RepRap. This will then generate a familiar pattern, and you can set up a line in your config G file with your correct value. RepRap firmware supports BL Touch and other ABL systems, but on my printer, I was using manual mesh bed leveling. Despite not having a probe, there's still lines of configuration in config G. You can see here the top one disables the probe, but it still defines an area for a grid. In my case, 20 millimeters in from the edge with points spaced out 65 millimeters apart. G29 is used like in Marlin. If you have a BL touch or other probe, it will use that. But without a probe defined, manual mesh bed leveling will take place where you slide a piece of paper underneath and at each point adjust the height until the paper has just enough clearance. 
before you click OK and the printer moves to the next probing point. When you're done, the results are saved in a CSV file on the SD card and if you add G29S1 into your start G code, they'll be retrieved before every print. This bed is definitely warped, but with my usual X test, sufficient compensation took place. With my end stop design, I needed X to home before Y to avoid any collisions. Also in the sys folder on the SD card are a range of other configuration files. The one I needed was home all, and here I edited the code to home X first and then Y to avoid any troubles. This worked perfectly and I was really glad to have that much control over the process. One other thing worth mentioning are macros. We have a folder on the SD card and in it we can create any files with G code we want to run. For instance, this one will preheat PLA and it's just got both the commands to set the bed and then hot end. The macros will now appear on the panel view touchscreen and with a single press, you can run multiple lines of G code. They'll also show up in the web interface, which we're gonna talk about now. The web interface is like an inbuilt version of Octoprint, except you don't need to buy a Raspberry Pi. Funnily enough, the Wi-Fi board is the only one that comes with inbuilt Wi-Fi. So I had to wait till everything was set up to move the printer into a separate room with an ethernet cable and to try this out. Just like Octoprint, once you're connected to the network, in your browser you load up the IP address and then you have a really slick interface. We have a range of manual printer controls. There's also a console for directly communicating with the printer. There's a button to visually inspect the height map from probing. You can upload to the SD card and access all of the print jobs. With a single click, you can run any of your macros. And if you right click, you can edit them right inside the browser. And the same goes for any of your configuration files that are inside the sys file of the SD card. You can make changes here, save them in the browser and reboot the printer for them to take effect. You can also update the base firmware from this screen. One thing I wasn't able to try was adding a Wi-Fi webcam, so I'm not sure how that will show up in this interface. Overall, this is very slick and as far as I can tell, is quite customizable. I've ordered this Wi-Fi dongle add-on in an attempt to give it Wi-Fi permanently. Let's finish by looking at my print results after this modification. In redoing the wiring, the part cooling fan seemed to fix itself. And these cubes look pretty good, but the pressure advance didn't really work as I expected, so I'll have to revisit it. The after rook also looks good. It definitely benefits from the part cooling fan being fixed, but I'm not sure if it's just me, but there might be slightly less surface artifacts compared to the old setup with the 2130s. So I'm still pretty new to this and I'm probably just scratching the surface, but I feel I know enough now to get my head around the tremendous potential of this hardware as well as the RepRap firmware. While the hardware is undoubtedly expensive compared to other budget offerings, it does seem to be top quality and the whole ecosystem makes a lot of sense. But hopefully I've shown you enough in this video for you to make an informed decision. As for the RepRap firmware, from my early exposure, I'm also a fan. Once I negotiated those initial hurdles of it being so unfamiliar, I could really start to see how feature packed it was and how easy it is to set up. It has one main advantage over Marlin and that's that Marlin tries to cater for so many different hardware combinations. Whereas RepRap firmware is catered for this specific hardware and that simplifies a lot of things. I'll continue to tweak and learn from this but I am interested to see if this video has influenced your opinion and whether you're willing to upgrade to Duet 3D hardware and RepRap firmware in the future. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.